Tyrus webinar. Uh, this is Andy Forsetto, broadcasting from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology Headquarters office. Uh, we're in Washington, D.C. For those of you who aren't familiar with uh, IRIS, we're a nonprofit consortium of universities and also a science facility that's funded by the National Science Foundation to operate a variety of programs designed to enable uh, a suite of research in seismology. Uh, if you don't know me personally, I'm a project assistant at IRIS, uh, kind of go by the term of a Swiss Army knife, helping to manage EarthScope's US Array, the Global Seismic Network, and a number of other programs that we house here. Uh, one of those programs is this webinar series. So uh, during the webinar, after the webinar, if you have ideas about uh, how we can improve the process of doing these uh, or uh, for speakers that we could have in the future, please let me know. I'm always interested to get feedback from the audience and uh, and feedback that I've received over the last year that we've been doing these has been really helpful. Uh, just uh, to highlight uh, what we have in terms of webinars already, uh, I have the IRIS webinar page loaded up here. So this is uh, www.iris.edu slash headquarters slash webinar. And you can scroll through here Click on each uh, icon will take you to a, a YouTube archiving of that webinar. And also we have our little coming soon tab at the top. And so uh, Doug is obviously our, our webinar speaker today, but uh, we'll have Emma, Elmer Rigrock from uh, Delft University. He's actually our first European speaker. He will be uh, uh, in a couple weeks and then subsequent webinars. There's actually three that have been scheduled now that I need to add to this. Uh, one is on uh, April 10th by Scott St. George at University of Minnesota. Uh, it's an early career focused webinar looking at uh, how to give a, the most effective PowerPoint presentation and how to convey research uh, visually. On April 24th, uh, Fanchi Lin will be giving a uh, seismology focused webinar. And on May 22nd, Paul Richards will be giving a webinar on uh, verification seismology, which is a hot topic after the recent uh, nuclear test in North Korea. So uh, just to outline for everybody how the webinar works. Uh, so uh, when this begins, only the speaker, uh, Doug Weens, and I will be unmuted. So if you have a question as the webinar is unfolding, then what you can do is use the question box on your webinar control panel, which is sort of floating off on the screen uh, to the left or right side, to actually just type in that question. That question will come through to me, and I will accumulate those as the webinar is proceeding. And then at the end, I will uh, read your name and the question that you've asked to Doug, and then he will respond to you. And if you have a, a follow-up question or anything, that's totally fine, and, and uh, I'll be able to handle those as well. Uh, both the presentation and the questions afterwards and the introduction right now is being recorded. And this is going to be posted on the IRIS website uh, after the webinar is finished, usually within a couple of days. So uh, if you think that a friend of yours might be interested in this, uh, you can direct them to that. Uh, if there's a technical hiccup and the webinar blows up, uh, that's happened once, you can just give it a moment and we'll reboot it and you can log back in like uh, nothing else happened. And uh, also just uh, for my personal interest, if you're out there watching with a group of people in a, in a lab somewhere, uh, just give me a head count if you get a chance. I'm always interested and we keep a count of how many single users are in here, but it's always good to know if there's uh, additional people uh, who are taking this in as well. So uh, that's all I want to say up front. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, Doug's out there, our speaker. I'm going to unmute him and make sure that his audio is good to go. All right, Doug, you should be unmuted. Yep, I'm here. All right. Uh, so uh, I'll just uh, uh, do a quick introduction for uh, for you, Doug. Our speaker today is Dr. Uh, Doug Weens. He's a professor at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, Doug received his master's and PhD from Northwestern. He's been deeply involved in the Irish community for over 25 years, uh, and this includes research places all over the world, including Antarctica, Africa, and uh, of, of note to this talk, uh, across the Pacific Ocean. So I think without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Doug, for your talk today, which is Under the Sea, Ocean Bottom Seismology for Landlubbers. 
Well, thank you, Andy. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, to bring this uh, webinar to the community. Uh, I think this is a really important topic because uh, you know I would like to see uh, in the oceans um, in the next uh, you know over the next decade or so. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, so anyhow, just a little bit of background on myself. I'm not a marine seismologist. I, I didn't uh, get my PhD from an oceanographic institution or, or do any work at all in uh, marine work um, over the first uh, decade or so of my career. So it's something that I've come to later in my career just because uh, in order to solve the problems that I wanted to solve, we, we just basically had to have data from uh, seismic data from the seafloor. And, uh, and so that's really my, been my interest. And so I'm not a person who builds uh, ocean bottom seismographs. I'm really sort of an end user uh, of data from, from ocean bottom seismographs. And so I think that probably puts me in the same category as, as most of you uh, would be in most of the, uh, probably most of the, the seismology community around the world. So I'll try to cover some of the things here that that I had to learn as I got involved in, in uh, ocean bottom si uh, seismic work. And so I think it should be uh, very useful to other people who, who want to do the same. And uh, let's see, how do I advance my... Hmm. Should be either the mouse click or maybe a uh, on the keyboard. Okay. Do a, yeah. There. Okay. Okay, so... Um, I think there's some interference here between the webinar software and my PowerPoint. But anyhow, so if we look at a map uh, there um, on the left side of the figure here, and hopefully you can see my mouse, which I'm uh, going to nervously move around here. Um, if we look at a map of where seismic stations are around the world, of course, they're all basically all the permanent ones are on land, and so they they cover the continents quite densely. There's been a big effort to put uh, seismographs for the Global Seismic Network uh, onto some remote islands in the oceans, uh, even the you know islands like Pitcairn in the in the Pacific Ocean have a GSN seismograph on it, even though almost no people live there. Um, but it's still there's huge areas of the oceans that are not covered by by seismographs, and so unless we further develop the capability to do seismology in the oceans, uh, we're going to really be limited in terms of the, the area of the Earth that we can actually cover seismologically. And, and there's been uh, some plans through the years to try to better cover the oceans with seismographs. Uh, notably, there was an idea developed Ocean Seismic Network uh, starting even in the late 1980s um, to put seismographs, uh, hopefully permanent seismographs, various places in the oceans. But it's never been implemented because of the tremendous costs and the and the technologies that would be needed to to actually operate seismographs permanently in these places. So, so I guess I would say that the uh, portable ocean bottom seismographs that we deploy from ships and pick up from ships is really the the way that we're going to have to proceed um, in terms of getting data from the oceans over the next you know over the next decade or so. Um, how do we go to the next? Out here. Okay. So, and I guess the other thing I would say is that I just collected a few cartoons here from various science programs, um, and just to show the idea that even for regional studies where we want to study tectonic processes or, or structure and how that interacts with tectonic processes, many of the most important regions for us to study are actually beneath the sea. Um, so, for example, the seismogenic zone of uh, the, the of shallow thrust zone of major subduction zones, most of that lies uh, beneath the sea, um, and uh, as well as the incoming plate for, uh, for studying the, the recycling of material uh, through uh, magmatic systems. And, of course, the entire system of mid-ocean ridges lies beneath the, the, the sea. And so if we really want to study these regions seismologically, we're going to have to develop the capability uh, of uh, doing ocean bottom uh, seismology. 
So um, the outline here, I'm just going to basically start out with some uh, fairly basic information about ocean bottom seismographs. I'll talk a little bit about how they work, uh, because this really controls, of course, the kind of data that we can get from uh, ocean bottom seismographs. So I'll talk uh, a fair bit about data quality and, and what we can expect, what you can expect um, to get from, uh, from seismic data uh, that was obtained from an ocean bottom seismograph. It won't look exactly like data from a land seismograph, um, but that doesn't mean it's not good data. In, in some ways it may be better data. So, so uh, we'll talk about that and then we'll talk a bit about how to propose and execute an OBS project because uh, there's now a, an OBS um, uh, instrument pool that's uh, actually now managed by IRIS. Um, so uh, under funding from NSF, so it's really possible for any uh, PI to propose uh, and carry out an OBS project, but there's you know, additional steps that are required uh, relative to say proposing uh, you know a, a land-based um, seismic study. And then finally in the end I'll talk just a little bit about data analysis and give a few examples of results from OBS deployments uh, and then of course, at the very end, there'll be questions, which may be the best part of this, uh, of this whole uh, uh, exercise. So, um, so just kind of starting with some of the basic uh, aspects of ocean bottom seismographs, um, there are two fundamental types of OBSs. Uh, of course, OBSs come in all sorts of flavors and, and uh, many, many different designs, but we probably can classify them as two uh, into two sort of categories. Uh, one uh, would be uh, broadband or, or long-term deployment uh, OBSs that are basically for passive seismology. Uh, they can, uh, in general, record active source uh, like um, air gun shot data and so forth, but they're primarily designed for for passive recording, and they're similar to uh, land broadband seismographs in many ways in terms of the data and, and, and how they're used. Um, these uh, instruments are more expensive. They're, uh, they generally they, they contain a broadband or semi-broadband sensor. Um, they usually have the sensor in a, in a separate uh, pressure case which detaches from the main uh, equipment, uh, the main data logger and the rest of the package. And the reason for that is, is that there are currents on the seafloor, and if the instrument, if the sensor is in the main body of the package, it will probably be more unstable relative to these currents. Um, and the current technology is the duration of these uh, deployments can be up to about a year and a half. They are more heavy and, and more expensive, both because the, the equipment uh, is heavier and also because they need more batteries to, to last uh, that long. Um, then there's uh, a um, classification of OBSs, we would call them short period OBSs that are much lighter and easier to de deploy in general. Um, they generally have uh, something like a 4.5 hertz sensor, in other words a high frequency seismic sensor. Um, they can usually only last uh, somewhere between one to six months and these are much lighter, cheaper, and easier to deploy. And these are used for active source, in other words, air gun uh, source experiments, uh, and also for micro seismicity. Um, but they don't have the capability of staying on the seafloor as long. On the other hand, there's many more of these in general, and they can be deployed much faster, so that um, there have uh, been deployments of more than 100 of these at one time. Uh, and uh, the most broadband deploy that have been deployed at one time is more on the order of 55. Um, let's see. So just to, so most of the my discussion here is going to be oriented towards the broadband or uh, long-term OBS because I think that's what most of my work has involved, and I think uh, probably if if we have uh, kind of a audience from the land broadband seismic community, um, that's probably mostly what people will be interested in. Um, but some of these uh, aspects also apply to the short period uh, OBSs. 
Um, so this just outlines some of the main parts of an OBS. This particular uh, OBS is a scripts uh, from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Um, and this uh, photo is from one of our recent uh, deployments in the Mariana Islands. So basically there's a sensor in an aluminum sphere that, like I said, detaches. Uh, once this hits the ocean bottom, shortly after this hits the ocean bottom, then this uh, sensor will f uh, fall down from this arm and land on the ocean bottom separately from the, right, from the rest of the instrument package. Like I said, that's to protect it from the, the effects of currents. I mean, it doesn't totally mitigate the currents, but it does help. Um, then I think you can see the separate parts of the, uh, of the OBS. Um, a couple of things to point out. Uh, the way the OBS operates uh, is that uh, it goes down to the ocean bottom, and essentially it's waiting um, with the, the acoustic release here listening to signals in the water column. Uh, the ship, when you want to release the OBS, uh, the uh, ship has an acoustic deck unit uh, that will send uh, uh, acoustic code uh, through the water that will be picked up by the acoustic release uh, and then it will cause it to drop the anchor which is a heavy weight that's on the bottom of the ocean bottom seismograph here and you can see it's just a, a big metal weight here on the bottom uh, of this OBS and that anchor is then left on the bottom and the rest of the OBS is buoyant and so it will come back to the surface uh, in theory at least. Um, we do occasionally lose uh, ocean bottom seismographs uh, where they're not recovered and uh, that failure can be due to a number of different causes. Sometimes it's hard to determine the cause when an OBS just simply doesn't return. Um, most of the electronics are in this pressure case with the data logger. Um, the, there's a, in this case, there's another pressure case with the lithium batteries. Um, to run one of these OBSs for a year takes uh, quite a large number of uh, lithium batteries. They're lithium primary batteries, so they're used once uh, and then discarded, and that's a significant cost uh, for the experiment. Um, and this particular OBS uh, uses uh, syntactic foam for buoyancy. That's, that's foam which is very rigid and so it can withstand the high pressures uh, at great depths in the oceans. And indeed we found that um, for the deepest uh, OBS work, uh, deeper than five kilometers now, the, I think the OBS instrumentation pool only allows uh, the use of syntactic foam and not glass balls. Some other OBSs will have glass balls filled with air uh, for uh, for buoyancy, uh, but that's proven to be less reliable for for great depths. Um, okay. Okay. So um, then, looking at the uh, the U.S. broadband OBS uh, pool, um, there actually are three different types made by three different labs. Um, I was just showing you the scripts. Uh, implementation there in the last uh, in the last figure, um, but there are three different types. If you propose to to use uh, the OBS pool uh, to carry out an experiment using broadband OBSs, um, you won't be able to necessarily select which labs OBSs you will use. So uh, that will be assigned uh, by uh, uh, by after consultation with uh, Brent Evers, who's the IRIS. Uh, manager for the for the OBS pool and in the pool operators to see which uh, lab schedule your experiment will fit into, uh, but the capabilities are are are, are rather similar between these different uh, broadband OBSs. There are some differences. Uh, the Woods Hole ones uh, have a Garrel uh, 3T sensor, which is a standard land broadband uh, seismograph sensor. Um, and also uses a, a Quantera Q3030 data logger, which is a data logger that's also used on land. And uh, basically, it's kind of interesting. You can, for those of you that have used the Q330 on land, you might be interested in this this uh, photo of the Q330 customized to fit inside of a um, one of the glass balls, uh, thick. Uh, glass balls that can withstand high pressure. 
And um, so these customized Q330s are the data loggers for the Woods Hole uh, OBSs. Um, so you can see that this system is exactly the same as many people use uh, on land. And so it delivers very high quality data. Um, and uh, the one downside is that these um, Woods Hole OBSs use somewhat more batteries. There's trade-offs involved in all of these decisions and some of the OBSs have gone to using customized pieces of equipment uh, because they use lower power. Um, so for example, the Scripps OBS here does use an Anametrics 240 broadband sensor, but they use a custom data logger. Um, the Lamont Doherty uh, OBSs also use a somewhat customized sensor. They use a, a, a Mark Products L4 1 hertz sensor uh, that has a, a custom built amplifier to boost the long period response. Uh, so it performs much better than a standard 1 hertz sensor. It's really sort of a semi-broadband uh, sensor. There's been some discussion that Lamont may uh, go to uh, uh, using a Trillium Compact sensor, and they have gone to using a Trillium Compact sensor on their Cascadia uh, instruments. Now, all of these broadband OBSs provide four channels uh, of data. That's the standard uh, vertical. The horizontals, of course, are not oriented. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how to orient those those channels. Uh, and then uh, something that land people are not familiar with is uh, output from a differential pressure gauge, uh, which is um, basically giving you uh, changes in in pressure in the water. So sort of it's a, a bit like a broadband hydrophone uh, is one way to think about it. Um, and uh, we'll talk later about the usefulness of this uh, DPG as we call it. Um, okay, so um, I've showed you the standard uh, ocean bottom seismographs. There are some uh, new developments that have happened recently, uh, and in particular, just highlighting a few of them on, on this uh, page, uh, this Cascadia project has uh, built a number of new OBSs for use in Cascadia and one of the issues there is that uh, many of the sites uh, where we wanted to deploy OBSs in Cascadia were in shallow water uh, where their uh, OBSs are in danger of being uh, hit by or, or disturbed or damaged by uh, trawlers. In other words, uh, fishermen that are using trawling equipment um, that basically goes along the seafloor and, and uh, disturbs everything. Uh, along or just or damages everything uh, with the trawl equipment. Um, and so both uh, Scripps with this abalone uh, instrument and Lamont with uh, their um, uh, new shielded OBS uh, have developed uh, OBSs that will uh, that will withstand uh, trawling. Uh, and these are deployed, these are suitable for are specialized sort of for being deployed in shallow water. It's also thought that these shields will provide some uh, uh, improvement in performance by reducing the current noise uh, on the uh, on the sensors. Another type of innovative approach is uh, in uh, one of the experiments I was involved in. Uh, we attached uh, magnetometers to the o ocean bottom seismographs so that we could collect uh, MT data. Uh, along with uh, the standard seismograph data, and there's other developments that are being that are being worked on. Uh, for example, there's a lot of interest in uh, developing a buried OBS or an OBS with a buried sensor because that would uh, improve the the noise characteristics uh, on the horizontal components, uh, which suffer a lot from uh, from the effects of currents and tilt. Um, so uh, just going on to talk a bit about data quality. I hear a lot when I talk to people, people say, well, the data from the seafloor is noisy, or, uh, or there's a feeling that the data from broadband data collected from the seafloor is not as good as uh, with land stations. And that's not really the case. Um, what is the case is that the noise characteristics on the seafloor are different from on land. And so therefore you, you don't have the same uh, bands uh, of, of 
of frequencies that have quiet uh, noise characteristics that we're used to uh, from the uh, from the surface. So, so this is a figure uh, from the um, a borehole seafloor seismograph, the, the OSN one uh, that was deployed uh, near Hawaii uh, in the late 1990s, and along with uh, and this dotted line here is uh, the land-based low noise or high noise model, and uh, you can see. And then there's also the low noise model, which is sort of the, the quietest land seismographs. Uh, and you can see that there are certain bands where the the seafloor data are very quiet, um, most notably at fairly high frequencies, uh, frequencies higher than about uh, maybe half of a second period or two hertz. Um, and then there's sort of a, a band here with, with relatively quiet data uh, around uh, maybe 10 to, 20, 10 to 20 or 10 to 30 seconds period. Um, data here uh, is noisy in the microseism peak, but um, there, it, will it turns out that they're really no, no more noisy in this area than adjacent island stations are because uh, you know, the noisiest land stations in the world are for example, island stations in the Pacific. So although the seafloor stations are quite noisy in the microseism peak area, they're similar to nearby land seismographs. Um, one area where the performance is worse than land seismographs is in the long period band, um, where we see uh, noise on the verticals uh, that is due to pressure variations from the uh, long period ocean waves uh, going over and uh, essentially uh, deforming the seafloor uh, up and down. Um, and then also on the horizontal components, or particularly in the horizontal components, uh, and that noise is thought to be primarily due to tilt uh, that's inter introduced by currents. Um, and uh, that can be reduced somewhat by, by burying the, the sensors. I'm going to talk a fair bit here about this um, vertical uh, long period noise because it's actually possible to get rid of, of a lot of that. So, uh, and this is uh, really quite important in terms of making this data uh, useful. So this is just a figure here um, comparing the uh, performance of land and, and uh, uh, seafloor uh, instruments in terms of noise. Um, H2O is a seafloor instrument um, between Hawaii and California along a, uh, along a cable that operated for a while. Um, and then uh, KIPP and, and POHA are stations in, in Hawaii and in, um, I think this is Berkeley and another station in California. And so what you can see here is that the noise, this is noise on the vertical component, um, noise um, from the seafloor instrument, and this was not a borehole instrument, this was a sea surface or seafloor, I'm sorry, seafloor instrument, um, was quite similar to land instruments nearby uh, over this uh, range here, which is um, sort of three to ten seconds in the microseism peak, um, and actually was similar to the land or even lower than some of the land stations in this range here from about 10 to 20 seconds, but then it gets really poor out here past 20 seconds. And that's this uh, influence of the pressure uh, variations due to the uh, uh, long period ocean waves or infragravity waves uh, that uh, essentially cross the oceans. And the pressure variations from short period waves do not penetrate um, all the way to the seafloor for a deep OBS deployment, but the pressure variations from the long, peri long period waves uh, on the order of 50 or 100 seconds in for gravity waves do penetrate all the way to the seafloor, and so they actually deform the seafloor up and down, and that's essentially the source of the seismic noise here. Uh, and we can see that by looking at this uh, plot on the right of the coherence, um, and so basically this is the similarity between the pressure variation um, and the vertical component seismograph. So the pressure variation um, we get from the DPG sensor, the differential pressure gauge sensor that I was just mentioning before when we talked about equipment. Um, and so the red 
symbols, and this is a figure that I got from Don Forsyth. The, the red symbols here are showing the coherence uh, between the, uh, essentially between the, um, the uh, um, uh, pressure sensor uh, and the vertical component seismograph um, when there's Rayleigh waves passing by. Okay, when there's been a large earthquake and there's Rayleigh waves, and you can see that at that point they're both over this period band, uh, say between 1 and 50 seconds, or 10 and 50 seconds, uh, they're essentially recording, they're both recording seismic waves. The blue symbols, though, show the, the coherence um, at times when there is no earthquake. And so they're just showing the background noise. Uh, and what you see here is that um, at periods between uh, about uh, 30 and 100 seconds here, um, or 50 in 100 seconds, or 200 seconds, uh, you're seeing a really good correlation between the seismograph noise uh, and the pressure variations. Uh, and so that shows you that the, that the seismograph signal at those periods is coming just from those pressure variations. And so it's possible then to, to uh, look at this and develop a, a, a transfer function between the pressure variations uh, and the seismic noise. Uh, and get rid of that long period seismic noise. And that's shown on the next slide. Um, and this is a couple of examples of this um, uh, of this procedure. So basically that you calculate a transfer function between the pressure uh, from the uh, the pressure gauge and the vertical displacement uh, and then you use that transfer function to remove the noise from the pressure fluctuations. So uh, you essentially use the DPG record and the transfer function and subtract that from the from the observed seismograph seismogram and uh, then you get a corrected uh, seismogram that has the pressure noise removed um, and so this shows two examples of that procedure one is from the original paper that described this procedure by Webb and Crawford uh, and another one is a study um, by Bell and Forsyth that's in in preparation, and you can see from the Bell and Forsyth case here um, that a signal that would apparently have no Rayleigh wave arrival at all. Uh, well, this is the pressure variation on the top. The vertical displacement seismogram uh, is in the middle, and you can't really even pick out the Rayleigh wave on that successfully. But when you remove the pressure fluctuations from that signal, uh, then you can see the Rayleigh wave. Uh, with actually quite a bit of uh, good signal to noise, uh, and you could use that uh, Rayleigh wave to uh, to study uh, uh, the structure of that area. So, and this is uh, at about a 67 to 125 second band pass. So it's showing you a really nice long period Rayleigh wave uh, there in that case. Once you remove uh, remove the noise, um, so. Um, so going on to a couple other data issues that are important for ocean bottom seismographs. Uh, one issue that you have to think about with an OBS is, is the timing quality. Uh, OBSs have uh, low power, high quality clocks that have uh, drift rates uh, of about uh, a third of a second to about one second per year. Um, and so the way that's dealt with is that uh, as soon as you recover the ocean bottom seismograph, then the clock is synced uh, with GPS, and the you know the amount of error at recovery uh, is is recorded um, to get the total drift, clock drift during the deployment, uh, and then the time is then corrected, assuming a linear drift rate. And um, if you really have a linear drift rate, then this should be a really nice procedure, um, and it should give you times you know that are accurate to. I don't know, within maybe a, a hundredth of a second or something. But the problem is that we can't be sure that the clocks are really showing a linear drift rate. And a number of people have tried to look at that, and uh, it seems dubious that the, that the drift is really totally linear. So the implications for that is that there might be clock errors on the order of a tenth of a second or so uh, in the OBS data. And um, that's not really significant for most large-scale broadband deployments where we're studying, say, Earth structure with 
with body wave or surface wave tomography, but it can be very problematic if we're studying microseismicity with a small array that we have out for a long period of time, uh, or if we have uh, some sort of a more closely spaced array uh, for maybe uh, some sort of array study. Um, so this is a potential limitation on the use of, of uh, OBSs. And atomic clocks are now being investigated as a possible solution to, to get a, a lower drift rate uh, there. And uh, one other thing that um, I think uh, you all probably realize needs to be done uh, is the horizontal components need to be oriented. Um, if you uh, just look at OBS uh, data, uh, they, it will come in uh, on, vertical and an H1 and H2 components and you don't know the direction that those compo horizontal components are pointing uh, because the OBS has just been dropped uh, and it, you don't know how it's going to land on the seafloor. So um, if air guns are used, if you do this as part of an active source experiment, then the best orientation results probably come from the particle motions of the water wave from the air gun. Um, but if there are no air guns involved in your experiment, uh, then uh, P or Rayleigh polarizations uh, from known earthquakes can be used to orient uh, the components. And uh, Rayleigh wave polarizations seem to work best. And there's a really nice paper uh, by Stachnik et al., uh, 2012 in, in uh, SRL, that uh, outlines a pretty good method for finding the, the orientation of the horizontal components. Uh, and basically, uh, you take the Hilbert transform of the uh, assumed radial component to remove the phase shift between the, the radial and vertical components of the Rayleigh wave, and then you compute the correlation uh, and try like uh, try a lot of different possible radial directions, and where you get the highest correlation coefficient that gives you the Rayleigh polarization, which should be radial from the source. Um, and then this is just a uh, kind of an example of that procedure uh, that they applied to uh, to one of their uh, OBSs that were deployed off of New Zealand, and uh, you know basically for this particular OBS, so you do a bunch of earthquakes that way. Uh, it looks like they did something like 30 or something uh, in this case, uh, and then this um, rose diagram here gives uh, essentially a, a chart. Uh, of the uh, orientation directions from all those different earthquakes. And they can actually narrow down the orientation of the components to about uh, plus or minus maybe five degrees. So that procedure seems to work really well. Um, okay, and I'm going to, uh, over the next um, part of the talk, I'm going to talk quickly about how to propose and execute an OBS experiment. Um, and uh, the first parts of this, we'll talk about the proposal process, and in uh, and then later on, I'll talk about how, what you actually are involved in being a PI in an OBS uh, experiment. Um, so, um, you know, there's a need for quite a bit of planning actually at the proposal stage because you have to request uh, adequate resources to carry out the experiment. Um, it's a little more important here than for land experiments because you need to make sure you request adequate ship time, you need to make sure that you request uh, enough, enough ocean bottom seismographs, it's going to be almost impossible to add more resources later on. Um, so, you know, one issue is planning the array. Um, and here I'm talking about broadband experiments, uh, similar to sort of broadband Pascal or land experiments. Um, the array planning for passive OBS experiments is somewhat similar to land experiment planning, but there's a few differences to think about. Um, one of these differences is cost. Um, the uh, cost for adding additional ocean bottom seismographs to an experiment uh, is quite high, um, something on the order of ten or $12,000 per broadband uh, instrument. Um, and so you really want to not be too ambitious in terms of the number of ocean bottom seismographs that you propose to deploy. The largest experiments have been around 50 uh, ocean bottom seismographs. Most uh, of them are sort of on the order of maybe 15 to 20. 
uh, ocean bottom seismographs. and graphs. Um, and ship time uh, is another consideration. Uh, ship time is expensive and ships travel slowly. So uh, this makes very large scale experiments uh, like um, covering a, a whole section of the Pacific Ocean or something like that extremely expensive and, and difficult to, uh, to get funded. Um, water depth is another issue uh, to consider. Um, standard ocean bottom seismographs can be deployed from about one to five kilometers water depth. And very shallow, less than one kilometer, or very deep, uh, five to six kilometer deployments necessitate particular equipment. Uh, and you should probably talk to uh, somebody uh, about the availability of that equipment. Currently, none of the U.S. Uh, fleet uh, OBSs can be deployed to depths greater than six kilometers, although there's some work being carried out on possibly developing uh, some of these deep OBSs. And the duration, uh, basically OBSs are limited to about 18 months duration, uh, but uh, most experiments are uh, limited to about 12 months uh, because obviously timing accuracy goes down with duration. Uh, it's thought that probably the reliability and the chance of getting the OBSs back uh, are reduced somewhat with increased time. So uh, in most cases, the limit is about 12 months. And just to, um, a couple of considerations to think of before uh, as you do your proposal. Uh, one big difference between OBSs and a land experiment is uh, in a land seismic experiment, you seldom have a, a, a seismic station where you have absolutely no data returned from that station. You may have the station be down for six months, but the other six months you'll have some data. In an OBS experiment, you will uh, sometimes have uh, OBSs uh, that you've deployed where there's no data returned at all, either due to uh, equipment failure or uh, failure of the OBS to return uh, at all and be recovered. So um, when you plan your experiment, it you must design the experiment so that a complete failure of something like 10 or 20 percent of the OBSs to return data uh, does not undermine your objective. Um, and uh, um, a couple of other, maybe I'll just um, skip over a couple of those uh, items there, but you can read them. Um, this just shows an example here of a recent OBS experiment that I've carried out. Uh, along with some of my colleagues. Uh, this is to study the structure of the Tonga Arc and Lao Back Arc Spreading Center and uh, basically shows the configuration of ocean bottom seismographs that we used. Um, there's always a trade-off between resolution um, and uh, trying to go to a 3D geometry or a 2D geometry. A 2D geometry you can have much better spatial resolution and so here we tried to uh, sort of hit the median uh, between having good resolution on a couple of 2D profiles and a more sparse resolution uh, on a 3D profile uh, with some OBSs that are scattered farther away from the array to use for uh, things like a larger scale surface wave uh, study. So um, it's the same kind of trade-off in general though that you get for experiments uh, on the land. Okay, then you also have to think about a cruise track and how much ship time you would need to carry out the experiment. Um, and it's useful to do a, a simple estimate of that or a cruise track plan uh, for your proposal. Uh, this is one that we had for one of our experiments uh, in the Mariana Islands. And um, so uh, you need to allow time uh, for the deployment of the OBSs, how long uh, it takes to uh, prepare them and drop them at a, at a given site. Um, there's some guidelines for that on the OBS IP uh, website. And then um, how do you actually uh, get in line to get uh, OBSs? So uh, before you submit your proposal, you need to uh, contact uh, Brent Evers at uh, at IRIS 
and go to the uh, <coughs> the OBS IP uh, website uh, where there's an online form and you can specify there the number and type of instruments that you want to uh, use in your experiment um, and uh, um, there's a bunch of information here like the funding uh, agency, a special program at NSF, program manager and so forth to give IRIS uh, and uh, OBS operators a better idea of what you are trying to accomplish. Um, and uh, um, in, it's important to put in here the durations of the cruises because they're going to have to cost out uh, or estimate how much uh, technician time will be needed uh, for your cruises. And what you will get then back before you submit your proposal uh, is an informational budget. So um, the OBS instrumentation pool does not work like Pascal where uh, there's been a bunch of money transferred to Pascal through, you know, through IRIS, uh, the IRIS uh, cooperative agreement uh, that funds all of Pascal's operations including their providing you with instruments. Uh, in the case of, of the OBS instrumentation pool, the costs of your experiment will have to be estimated separately and then your program manager will have to pay those costs. That doesn't appear as part of your institution's budget, so like it never appears on my Washington University budget, um, but it appears as a separate page at the back of your proposal. And so um, this is just an example of the informational budget for our recent the recent Mariana experiment that Dan Lazaraldi and I carried out, <laughs> and uh, um, so in this budget they estimate uh, sort of an average cost, you know, for the whole for each per instrument for your whole experiment, and then this goes as a supplementary document on your NSF proposal. And in addition to requesting the, OBF, the OBSs themselves, uh, you have to make a ship time request form uh, unless you're piggybacking on somebody else's cruise. Um, so uh, in order to do the ship uh, request, you go to the uh, UNAL site, um, which is the organization that coordinates all the academic fleet, and uh, you would put in uh, information about what kind of ship you need, the number of science days you need um, and what other kinds of equipment your sh uh, ship needs to be equipped with um, and likely the ports that you would need and so forth. Uh, in general, uh, most uh, OBS deployments except maybe very small uh, ones off the coast would use either a global ship, which are the large kind of ships that can go anywhere on the globe, uh, or the intermediate uh, ships. Um, and uh, so then this would also need to be submitted and uh, a copy of your request needs to be attached to the proposal. So then um, assuming that you get funded then uh, then you may have to do some pre-cruise uh, planning in order to carry out uh, your experiment and so um, if you're named the chief scientist of your cruise then you'll have to submit a cruise plan to the ship operator that will detail all the objectives of your cruise um, and gives a cruise track with waypoints and provides a timeline uh, and lists all the people who are coming along on the scientific party including uh, all the uh, OBS technicians and you may have to have meetings or conference calls uh, with the ship operator regarding the details of the cruise and as chief scientist you're responsible for organizing the scientific party and uh, basically being the scientific contact for all aspects of the cruise. Um, and uh, another thing when you're out deploying the OBSs, um, you have sort of a nominal deployment spot for your OBS, but uh, OBSs should be dropped on fairly flat sites and far from hazards such as mudslides and volcanoes. Um, here's a picture of an OBS that was actually covered by a lava flow uh, in, along the East Pacific rise uh, and you don't want that to happen. Um, so uh, basically when you're on the cruise you usually want to uh, look at bathymetry that's obtained from the ship 
uh, and make sure that you're citing your OBSs uh, properly relative to the bathymetry uh, in that area. And uh, if you're chief scientist, you'll be responsible for representing the scientific party in cruise decision making. So, for example, if the weather causes changes to the cruise plan, it will be, um, you know, you and the captain will talk uh, and discuss, you know, how to change your plan in order to still accomplish your, uh, your objectives. Uh, and uh, basically, you, may, you will also need to, to furnish uh, some uh, people to help with operations. All the main uh, OBS operations are covered by technicians, but they expect to have some help on the scientific party. So normally, scientists will bring along grad students uh, to help with some of these, uh, some of these tasks. Uh, and so, and in the, I haven't said much about the recovery crews, but the recovery crews tasks are fairly similar to the deployment crews. Uh, you need to allocate time based on the depth and the rate at which the OBSs rise up because you can't start, uh, you know, you can't um, call up the OBSs until the ship actually arrives on station. Um, and you need some contingency time to allow for delays in, from, in the OBS from releasing from the bottom. There's occasionally uh, some delays um, uh, in the release of the OBS and the ship needs to stand by and wait for the OBS um, uh, for a few hours. And uh, um, the scientific party will assist in locating the OBS once it rises to the, to the surface. Um, and a lot of people ask about data. The, the OBS instrumentation pool is responsible for organizing the data. Uh, time correcting and doing basic uh, quality control. Uh, they'll usually provide you with a raw data set when you leave the ship uh, and then they'll submit the data to the IRS DMS and provide you with a copy uh, later after they've had a chance to do QC back uh, in their lab. Um, so just to say a little bit here in the time that we have left um, about data analysis and results most techniques that are widely used for land broadband seismic experiments can be applied directly to OBS data. And so, you know, there's been very successful work with OBSs in surface and body wave tomography, attenuation tomography, noise correlation analysis, uh, shear wave splitting, uh, all kinds of seismicity studies and seismic store studies, kind of the standard types of things we do with broadband seismographs. I would say the one real exception where there is some additional difficulty for OBSs uh, is receiver functions uh, because uh, there's a, a P wave reverberation in the water column uh, that often arrives uh, in the early part of the coda uh, of a typical, say, P wave arrival. And uh, this can obscure the, the P to S conversions from the MOHO or from deeper structure that's used in the receiver function analysis. Um, there has been some success in studying the 410 and 660 uh, discontinuities with uh, long period receiver functions because those conversions are further delayed uh, from the initial P wave arrival um, and also they can be studied with uh, low pass filtered uh, data. I think this is probably something that deserves further work uh, to determine whether there are techniques uh, that could be used to allow uh, better receiver function work. Uh, with uh, with OBS uh, with OBS data. Just to show then some of the classic uh, OBS uh, results from a few studies, and I'm sorry I don't have time to show more of this, but um, you know basically all of, all we know about uh, processes at mid ocean ridges, and all we know about seismic structure of mid ocean ridges basically comes from uh, ocean bottom seismograph work. And the classic experiment here was the melt experiment that was carried out uh, in the, uh, I guess it was around 1995, 1996. It was the first, uh, uh, well, maybe the second or so large scale OBS experiment um, that was carried out. And so we get this beautiful image here of the S wave velocity structure beneath the East Pacific rise from uh, love waves that show the asymmetry 
uh, of the low velocity layer or low, low velocity region, presumably the melt production area for the East Pacific rise. And it goes uh, much further to the west uh, than it does to the east and that there's increasing seismic anomalies as you uh, go shallower underneath the ridge crest. And the summary cartoon here from Don Forsythe's uh, uh, summary uh, in science that shows the basic results uh, of the MELT uh, experiment. Um, then uh, some work that, I, that I've done with my students. Uh, this is uh, P-wave tomography of the Mariana Arc uh, in Backark, uh, done with uh, a combination of land and ocean bottom seismographs. So you see the, the subducting Mariana slab, but you, in particular you see these very large um, slow velocity anomalies beneath the Backark spreading center and beneath the volcanic arc. And the anomaly beneath the volcanic arc is, is deeper uh, than the one beneath the Backark spreading center. Um, and if we compare that to the estimated equilibration depths of magmas from, from petrology, uh, you find that um, our anomalies uh, are sort of in the exact depth ranges that petrologists should expect uh, us to be seeing the melt production occurring. So we think that we're essentially imaging here the melt production regions for the back arc spreading center and the volcanic arc, uh, and that they're essentially separated um, you know, from each other, uh, at least at shallower depths. Um, then uh, some work that we're just working on right now. Uh, this is some work that my student Sean Wei uh, is uh, is um, finishing up, and this is uh, uh, analyzing data from the Lao Basin, the Tonga Fiji Lao uh, experiment, where we had uh, 50 ocean bottom seismographs. Uh, across the Lao Basin as well as a few land seismographs uh, on the islands and in looking at the shear velocity structure at different depths. So at 20 kilometers depth we're basically seeing the crust uh, in Fiji and Tonga and the Lao Ridge. Um, as we go deeper, 30 and 40 and 60 kilometers deep, we're seeing the magma production region for the Lao Back Arc Spreading Center. Um, and that seems to be uh, showing a much stronger anomaly to the north uh, than it is to the south. And so there's some really interesting um, aspects there because the, the um, geochemistry of this uh, spreading center varies dramatically along strikes. And in the south we have much more water, uh, much more fluid mobile elements coming in from the slab, which is also imaged there. Um, so we're trying to understand how uh, these changes along strike uh, from in the geochemistry are related to the seismic anomaly that we're seeing. Uh, and then we, we also get some really interesting results from the, from the anisotropy where this is anisotropy as a function of period and these uh, directions here would be uh, the directions in the and ge geographically so these uh, fast axes here would be but short periods would be east-west and these fast axes here at long period would be essentially north-south and so what we're seeing here is that in the Lao Basin we have a, an east-west spreading, uh, spreading direction and uh, at shallow depths we're seeing the anisotropy uh, in the lithosphere, uh, in the oceanic lithosphere in the direction of spreading. At deeper depths we're seeing north-south uh, fast directions which we think is due to inflow into the Lao Basin from the north uh, from the Samoa uh, region. Um, so um, one thing I also want to make sure that I mention in closing here is that there's now uh, community data. There's a community initiative to deploy ocean bottom seismographs along Cascadia. And this has been going on now for, I believe, a year and a half. Uh, the first year's data is back uh, from this deployment. And I believe it's now available from the, from the IRIS DMC. So, it's a tremendous opportunity for the whole community to get involved in seeing what ocean bottom seismograph data is like uh, and getting involved in the analysis of ocean bottom seismograph data um, using this uh, community data set uh, which where the data is available really as soon as it's collected and quality controlled. 
So I urge you to have a look at the Cascadia data and um, perhaps work on developing new methods for, for analyzing uh, OBS data. So anyhow, that's it. Uh, have some questions? All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Doug. Uh, you know, the webinar system doesn't have a way to simulate applause like you would normally have at the end of a colloquium talk, but uh, that was excellent. I think that was a uh, nice highlighting of a um, facility that we haven't really covered on the webinars before. So uh, I think I have a few questions lined up. I would encourage anybody else uh, who's in the webinar, if you have a question, uh, please type it into the, the question box. Uh, as we're going through these initial ones, uh, maybe your question's already been asked and it's about to get answered. But uh, uh, yeah, so we have um, a couple questions from Andrew Goodwillie, and he's curious uh, about coupling of the seismometer to the seafloor. Uh, one of his uh, questions slash comments was, I believe that land seismometers are installed in concrete bunkers to ensure very good coupling with the ground. How does the seismic signal propagate from the seafloor into the round ball containing the sensor? Well, I think, for, first of all, I think a lot of the land seismographs nowadays, many of them are just actually um, put in a hole and uh, packed with dirt uh, around, the, you know, around the sensor. That's a new new installation technique that's actually used for a lot of the seismographs that are not observatory uh, seismographs. But, um, but anyhow, the coupling issue is, is a really important one. Um, basically, the, the seismographs are designed so that the sensor ball you pack, you know, separates from the rest of the ocean bottom seismograph. And that helps uh, with the coupling because the sensor ball is usually heavily weighted um, and there are different designs. Um, the uh, Lamont uh, sensor balls have a, actually have a lead weight or is a steel weight, I'm not sure, at the bottom to try to help with coupling to the seafloor. Um, and uh, I believe um, Scripps also has something like that. Um, Woods Hole, I believe, just has the sensor ball package by itself. Um, but I think the main problem with coupling might be with a, a muddy layer or something like that. I mean, the problem, of course, is that when you deploy seismographs on land, um, you can at least find an area where you have very solid soil or hopefully rock to put the seismograph on. And uh, in the seafloor, oftentimes you have very soft mud, and so the sensor package may come to rest on soft mud, and uh, then that would uh, cause some problems with the coupling. Um, but So the coupling is kind of an issue. I think it's something that's talked about among the different OBS groups, and there are you know some arguments going on about what is the best sensor ball design in terms of ensuring that there's coupling, um, but you know, in the end, if you look at um, OBS data and compare it to adjacent land station data, um, it often looks very similar. So, you know, in terms of in terms of sort of uh, empirical uh, understanding of what's going on, uh, there's evidence that um, the OBS data you know is pretty good. It depends maybe a little bit on the frequency also that you're looking at because um, coupling is probably much more of a issue for higher frequency data than it would be for low frequency data. Okay, great. Uh, next question actually is also from Andrew uh, and his uh, follow-up is when the OBS is has landed on the seafloor, uh, how accurately can you determine its location? Yeah, I didn't really talk much about that, so it's a good question. Um, most of the time, for most of these deployments, we actually uh, um, use sonar ranging to determine the exact position of the OBS on the seafloor. So typically when you drop the OBS, it may drift, depending on currents, uh, up to like 500 meters away from the drop site. And um, 
then either right after you've dropped it or, or maybe right before you pick it up, um, you will sail the ship in a circle around the expected location of the of the OBS and um, you know sonar ping on it with sonar where you send a signal down and it will reply uh, with its transducer uh, the same system essentially that you use to uh, to call it up and uh, from the delay time of the reply then you can tell the range uh, of the uh, of the OBS from the point that the ship is at and so if you do that around the circle around the OBS then you have um, almost like an earthquake location problem in terms of uh, least squares problem to determine the best uh, location you know for the OBS that would you know that would fit all that um, data in terms of the delay times of the sonar signals um, there's a little bit of uncertainty there that is introduced by the speed of of the sound in water which is a function of temperature and other things but um, you know that only accounts usually for a few meters of uncertainty. So, so if you do that uh, procedure, which takes about anywhere between like a half hour or to an hour of ship time, uh, then you'll get a good estimate to within a, a few meters uh, of the location of the OBS on the seafloor. Um, and in, you know, indeed, when there have been OBSs on the seafloor, and then they've gone down with submersibles to look at them. Or uh, ROVs to look at them, you know they they can come right up to where they are. All right, great. Uh, next question is from uh, Maus Roish at uh, Pascal Instrument Center, and uh, Maus is curious: What kind of temperatures are the equipment experiencing at deeper depths? Oh, hey, Maus. Um, well, the temperatures are very, very stable. Um, unlike most of those experienced by your Pascal equipment and especially the Antarctic uh, equipment, um, the, the temperatures on the seafloor at depths of several kilometers in the ocean are very, very stable. And I'm not an oceanographer, but I think they're on the order of a few degrees centigrade. So, um, and there's really no variability uh, or very little variability. So. Um, although the seafloor environment is challenging for many respects, uh, temperature is not one of those. Um, so we don't really have to worry very much about temperature. Uh, okay. Next question is from uh, Akram Mostafanajad. And uh, Akram is curious, could you explain a little bit more about uh, the receiver function issues with OBS data? Well, I can try. I haven't actually worked with a lot on it myself, but um, the the issue there is that when a P wave uh, impinges beneath this, uh, an OBS, um, you know, normally with a land seismic station, uh, you would record the P wave arrival, and then you would soon after that uh, record um, conversions uh, from any structure below, like the MOHO or or other, you know structure uh, where the P wave uh, would have converted to an S wave. The S wave would be delayed relative to the P wave and then um, the S wave would arrive. The S wave motion is more on the radial component uh, whereas the P, P wave motion is more on the on the vertical component and so you can deconvolve the radial component with the vertical component uh, and uh, highlight then the these um, P to S conversions. And uh, uh, with OBS data, um, the problem is the delay times of those P to S conversions are on the order of a few seconds. But with sort of an average water depth, say something like four kilometers or something like that, um, you will have uh, the P wave uh, energy that, that came to your station, uh, your OBS, will continue up to the top of the ocean uh, and then reflect and then come back down and, and, and uh, essentially uh, be recorded by the station again. Uh, that we, you know, we call that a water reverberation and actually those reverberations will just continue going on. Uh, and uh, they can be kind of complicated if there's bathymetry and so forth. Uh, but basically what that means is you have a lot of other energy coming in 
um, in the seconds following the initial P wave arrival um, that can obscure those um, P to S conversions from the MOHO. Uh, and so that has been problematic uh, for, you know, for P wave receiver functions. One thing I think is probably worth exploring a little bit more for OBSs would be S-wave receiver functions because uh, S-wave receiver functions would involve a conversion from S to P and would then arrive before um, you know the main S-wave arrival so they may not have that problem uh, with uh, you know with the, the interference of the reverberations so it's a little bit almost a little bit like the problems that we face in Antarctica where we have an ice layer that also has reverberations in it and that can sometimes um, obscure uh, the uh, some of the receiver function signals that we'd like to see. Yeah, or even uh, sediment basins on land. I think that there's you know an increasing need to take a closer look at ways to get rid of those reverbs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Next question is from, actually, uh, another question from Akram. Uh, you know, this is more of a general question uh, that I might know the answer to as well. Um, you know, he's wondering, are OBS data publicly available? And of course, some are, but I'm not sure what the data policy is for those versus typical Pascal. Do you know that, Doug? Yeah, I think it's the same, essentially, that that um, you have uh, for a standard OBS experiment, um, you have uh, as a PI, uh, that proposed the experiment, you have two years of proprietary data uh, data access before the data are made are made public, um, and so um, there are now quite a few or a number of database you know data sets that are available from the Iris DMS um, you know OBS data sets that people could download and and uh, access. Um, like I mentioned, though, the Cascadia data set is more like the Earthscope data, uh, which is data that's collected and then made available right away as soon as it's collected because it's not, you know, it wasn't proposed by an individual PI. Um, it was a community experiment um, where the equipment came from actually uh, ARA funding. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so that's kind of the exception. Um, but most OBS data has that two-year delay time policy. I should mention that there are some of the really old OBS data sets like the MELT experiment data are not yet uh, available in the DMS and we're trying to make sure that that data is preserved and made available somehow. I uh, actually have a follow-up co comment from Brent Evers uh, who's the uh, OBSIP uh, program manager here at IRIS who's been sitting in on the webinar uh, and this relates Doug to Mouse's question. Brent uh, was saying that the, the temperature, uh, the lowest temperature you see at the bottom is typically uh, slightly below freezing so you know 29 Fahrenheit maybe negative one to two degrees Celsius uh, due to the salinity changes at depth. Thanks, Brent. Uh, next question is from uh, Diego Melgar. And Diego is curious, is there any work on uh, OBS strong motion sensors, either temporary or permanent? Huh, that's an interesting question. And, uh, you know, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, none that I'm aware of, but I, you know, I might not be aware of it if, if there was some work going on in that regard. And another quick follow-up uh, on the uh, data availability question. Uh, if anyone here is familiar with the uh, IRIS uh, DMC's website, you can go to the metadata aggregator uh, page, and there's a virtual network code for OBSEP data, uh, underscore OBSIP. And that will show you uh, what data is actually in the holdings presently. Uh, next question is from uh, Luis Marias, and uh, Luis asks: Any is there, has there been any successful example of waveform inversion used for earthquake source investigations from OBS data? Um, I believe there has been, but I'm trying to remember. 
trying to remember where that would have been. Um, I know there's been a lot of work with um, source work with, say, for example, aftershocks of the Tohoku earthquake that the Japanese have done with the OBSs that they put out after the uh, uh, after the earthquake. And I'm not sure if they used waveform inversion or if they used uh, like more conventional first motions and and uh, those kind of techniques. Um, I think, I mean, we have used waveform inversion to study the structure of uh, areas. So there's papers based on the MELT experiment data or the old Lao experiment data where we used um, waveform inversion from OBS data to look at structure. Um, so I would I can't put my finger on it, but I think there has been. All right. Uh, next question is from uh, Guo King Lin, and uh, he's curious: uh, How do things change when you're deploying OBS sensors at uh, shallow depths, like shallower than a hundred meters? Well, I mean, one thing one thing I mentioned during the talk was the danger of of damage to the OBS from from fishing and trawling, and um, before those before those uh, OBSs that I showed were were designed, there were a couple of disastrous experiments where people deployed OBSs not even in that shallow of water, but in areas you know that were heavily fished, and um, the OBSs would get trawled up uh, or destroyed by the by the fish trawling. So, um, so that you know that kind of danger increases uh, when you get to most shallow areas, depending on the amount of fishing that goes on uh, in that area. Um, another thing that changes, though, is uh, remember I was talking about the the effect of pressure on the seafloor uh, and the fact that the vertical component has a lot of noise on it, like at fifty or hundred seconds from the infragravity waves, where basically these these ocean waves are so long wavelength that their pressure um, changes uh, go all the way to the seafloor. Well, the the pressure changes from an ocean wave caused by an ocean wave decay with depth, but that depends on the on the period of the wave. And so, as you go to if you put your OBS in really shallow water, then the pressure uh, variations from shorter and shorter period ocean waves will penetrate to where your OBS is, and they will. You will also get these shorter period waves deforming the seafloor, and so essentially you collapse that, you know, that quiet re zone in frequency between 10 and 40 seconds or so down to nothing, uh, eventually as you go shallower, um, and so. It becomes essential then that you record the pressure with a DPG or with a some. Now they're using some absolute pressure gauges, um, APGs. Um, <clears throat> record the pressure uh, variations and in, um, correct the uh, you know determine the transfer function between pressure variations and seafloor deformation. Um, and in uh, and in the, you know correct your vertical component. Uh, waveforms for the for the pressure fluctuations caused by ocean waves. That whole problem becomes much worse. Um, the other problem with shallow uh, with a shallow deployment is that it's believed that in most shallow um, regions, or ocean currents are more of a problem, and than they are in, in in the fairly deep ocean. And so the pressure or the current uh, will cause a problem on the horizontals. Because it causes very small amounts of tilt, and horizontal components of a seismograph are incredibly sensitive tilt meters. In fact, they can be used as tilt meters. So, um, so you'll also probably get more noisy because of these currents. So, that's kind of why the Cascadia instruments are really innovative because they are using those shells around the uh, OBSs to see whether they can also then reduce. The amount of uh, the, the effect of currents on these shallow deployments, uh, and thus um, help get higher quality data in addition to protecting 
uh, from the trawlers. Okay, great. Um, next question is from Robert Weekly, and Robert's curious if differential pressure gauges are available for short period instruments in addition to broadband. Well, that would be a question that you should ask uh, the OBS uh, um, IP or ask Brent. I think they're not standardly deployed on the you know on the short period instruments. Now, you know because you know because uh, you know fortunately one one thing uh, because the the OBS instrumentation pool are, are sort of maintained by real engineers. Um, and and by the people who built them, they have a, a fair bit of flexibility to to um, help design uh, new combinations of equipment if it's warranted by projects that are funded. So, you know, that's something that would have to be discussed. And if and if they thought it was worth doing, uh, if you could convince them that it was worth doing, then you know it's, it's something that might be possible. But you'd have to you know discuss it with. Uh, with them. Okay. Uh, next question is from Ayub Kaviani, and uh, Ayub is curious: What can be done if the vertical component is somewhat tilted? Um, well, depending on the system that you have, they they um, usually uh, have a gimbal or some sort of uh, s uh, system inside the sensor ball that will orient this you know that is supposed to orient the sensor so that the vertical is very close to the true vertical um, because naturally these um, seismographs will come to rest you know sometimes on a slope of like you know 10 degrees or or even more to some extent you try to prevent that by looking at the bathymetry before you drop the OBS but in some cases there's no flat place around um, but then the gimbal inside the sensor ball should orient the sensor itself to being to being vertical. Um, there are, if you can measure the amount of, of, you know, if there is some deviation from vertical and you can measure it, then it would be relatively easy to remove it by doing some sort of rotation. Um, and I think there is a paper by, I think, Crawford and, and Webb uh, on correcting for, um, you know, correcting the vertical component for slight errors in um, in the vertical direction, and in particular, if you if the vertical is not oriented exactly vertical, then you'll get a lot of tilt signal on the vertical also, which can cause a lot of noise at long periods. So, if it isn't vertical, then you would want to correct it. Okay. Uh, I have a question from Greg Bren. Uh, Greg is curious, how do you know that you're deploying the ocean bottom seismometers onto solid bedrock rather than ocean sediment that may affect the signal? <laughs> well, you don't. <laughs> so, I mean, basically, um, you don't know what kind of topography in general you're deploying uh, these um, OBSs on. Um, in, in many cases, you look for flat areas to deploy them, and those areas are exactly the areas that are probably more likely to have uh, mud and soft sediments, you know, as compared to, you know, rocky areas that you might find on a steep slope. So I think a lot of the times we are deploying o OBSs on soft mud, and I think that does have an effect on the response at high frequencies, particularly. Um, it doesn't seem to affect the longer period signal, though, uh, very much. So it kind of depends on what you're trying to do, I think, in terms of how, how important that is. I know that, um, for example, some OBS seismologists will try to estimate the delay time caused by the soft sediment on the travel times using a, a P to S conversion, converted phase that you can often see coming in right, in, you know, Right before, or right after, I guess the 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 arrival, and then um, you know subtract that delay time off when they're locating micro earthquakes. But unfortunately, there's not much you can do. 
Okay, uh, just a couple questions left in the queue. Uh, a question from Luis Marias is wondering, uh, is there any use for or any, any recordings of uh, biologically generated signals recorded on OBS, like whale calls? Oh, yeah, actually there is quite a bit of work that can be done with whale calls um, recorded on, on OBSs. Um, I know, like for example, um, from our uh, the Lao Basin experiment that I showed you the layout from, uh, one of the investigators on that project was Rob Dunn, and he has a student who's um, studying the uh, whale calls that were recorded by that uh, by that OBS experiment. Um, and uh, if you record at something like a hundred hertz, um, you will record a lot of whale calls and that. That information can be very um, useful to uh, to whale uh, scientists, and there's um, you know there's a number of people that have gone into studying that uh, either with seismographs or more typically with hydrophones. But um, those kind of signals are recorded, you know, as a matter of course uh, in a seismic experiment like uh, like these ocean bottom seismograph experiments. There are other signals. Strange signals that are on <laughs> that are on OBSs that um, we can't identify what they are, and so um, there's theories about what causes certain kinds of signals. And some of the theories are that you get you know fish bumps and things like that. Um, but without a camera or something like that, it's hard to really um, say anything um, uh, convincingly. Uh, about those signals. Okay, uh, I have a question from Maggie Benowit, uh, who is wondering if you could, if there's a way to uh, to estimate how wide an aperture and array could be before the ship time gets prohibitive, prohibitively expensive. Huh. Well, um, I mean, all one could really do, I guess, is um, well, it depends on also whether you would have like a, a two-dimensional aperture or whether it's a simple line because you could do a long line um, relatively easily, you know, um, but where you get into a lot of ship time is when you try to do a 2D grid. Um, so the one, I mean, a few guidelines would be that, that normal cruises uh, of UNOL ships are usually on the order of like 20 days, sometimes as many as 30 days, um, and then uh, ships travel about 12 knots. So, you know, you can do sort of a simple estimate then if you if you think of your layout uh, and then tally up the total distance between all the points, uh, and then uh, you know, and then divide by uh, by 12 knots in terms of the speed of the ship. Um, you will spend like a few hours on you know on site for deploying each OBS, um, but if you're talking about a relatively sparse but large array, then maybe the time that you're actually deploying the OBSs doesn't matter very much, um, and so that would give you some idea of how long of a cruise you'd end up with, and so I think typically if you submitted a proposal, there'd be a reluctance to fund. I'm not saying it's impossible, but there'd be a reluctance to fund maybe you know work that would take up more than one sort of major cruise um, unless you had really strong justification. Yeah, I mean there are I mean the Cascadia project though, um, you know at that scale where it's a community experiment, uh, you know each summer the there are several cruises to service the Cascadia experiment. So, you know, it is possible to have larger projects, but it would just, um, they'd be subject to extra scrutiny, I think. Okay, uh, I have a couple questions by Mosen Faroki. Uh, first question is, what is the high frequency limit uh, when you're looking at OBS data? Um, well, I don't really work on the high frequencies, so I'm not really too sure about that. I know that the that the um, active source people typically record at several hundred hertz. So um, you know, so they're typically recording at like 
I don't know, 200 hertz. So there, the Nyquist would be 100 hertz. Um, and I know that hydrophones will frequently record much higher than that. So the whale people, will, the people who study marine mammals, will often record, um, you know, up to a thousand hertz uh, using a hydrophone. So they can record, you know, like dolphins and things. Um, so um, it's not clear to me that there's a real limit in terms of what you can record. Uh, so, and I'm not quite sure how far out the present equipment would actually record. Okay, uh, his second question, I think this is the last one, unless anybody uh, gets one in the last minute or so. Uh, but uh, the question is, how can you, is there any way to check the performance of an OBS after it's deployed? <laughs> yeah, we'd like to do that. Um, the problem is that, of course, radio waves and light waves don't penetrate to the depths of ocean of OBSs. Um, there have been some instrument packages that have been equipped with acoustic modems, which will, you know, can send information back if they're programmed properly, um, and. The information would, would um, the baud rate is really, really slow on acoustic modems to the ocean. So you can't send all the data back to a ship, even if the ship were willing to wait around, or a buoy were waiting to wait, or willing to wait around um, and record that all. Um, but you could send state of health data back. So you could get information on, say, that the OBS was working uh, and so forth. Um, but that would only be if you had a buoy or a ship, you know, in the area uh, of the OBS. Now, people have talked a little bit about, you know, having, you know, some sort of module that would pop off the OBS and come up and, um, you know, surface and then send data back by satellite or something like that. Um, but those kind of developments, I guess, would be in the future. So I guess the answer really is no, not with standard OBSs. The, in terms of things that could be developed, one could develop something to get state of health back with an acoustic modem if you had a buoy nearby um, or a ship nearby um, or that sort of thing. Um, or you could equip your OBSs to at least tell the ship before it leaves um, that it's working on the bottom. Those kind of, that kind of data could be transmitted through, this, through the water. But not, you couldn't get all the data back. All right. Well, uh, there aren't any more questions, and uh, and it's it's been one of the more productive question sessions actually. After a talk, it's a good half an hour of uh, uh, questions, so that's great. Um, so yeah, I think uh, Doug, I'll just uh, I'll thank you one more time. It was a great talk. Uh, I think people were really um, interested. And uh, I want to thank everybody in the audience for coming today. And uh, there'll be another webinar in about two weeks. Uh, so stay tuned for emails, and we'll see you here next time. And Doug, okay. uh, take, take care. Thanks again. Well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to email me. OK, uh, yep. Uh, please do. And I, like I said earlier, the webinar will be um, uploaded in the next couple days. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Okay.